Welcome back to another episode of Stuck in the Nail, the only podcast on the internet talking about specifically ground combat in the game of Star Citizen. Uh, we have a unique guest with us today. Today, uh, Echo is on a vacation. He's out watching some hockey on the road, doing his thing. So uh, we had plans to have this guest on with Echo, but it so happened that it's happening now. So uh, Echo sends his best. But with us today, we have Callie Joshua. Callie Joshua, welcome. How are you today? Thanks for having me here. Uh, I'm doing very well. It's been a very busy week, and uh, I'm glad we're able to sit down and do this. I know, yeah. We've been playing the, um, uh, like the, you know, the uh, coordination version of a whack-a-mole, trying to get time <laughs> schedules back. Yeah, but that's life, man. That's life. You know, you got, uh, you got family. Hey, you you got we're work. not all full-time, highly paid podcasters. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, full time maybe, because yeah. Uh, yeah, you, that's it does take a lot of time, but definitely not highly paid. So it does. Um, yeah. yeah, for yeah. those of you guys joining us uh, again, thanks, welcome back, thanks for all of your viewership so far. Uh, it's been fun, and sorry for the delay. We've had a few uh, weeks of lapse between episodes, but um, yeah, I guess I'll give a, a kind of a brief intro. But I'm kind of meeting you for the first time tonight too, isn't that right? So, yeah, I mean, we've had some some texts back and forth, but this is the first time we're actually I can hear your voice and there's a face. Yeah. Although you do have more hair. I was going to yeah. say if Echo was here, <laughs> you guys stole all my hair. So yeah, I took all. It's kind <laughs> of a... That's a good point, man. We took it all. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. We should have left some for you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so Callie, kind of how we found Callie Joshua, uh, is we as a ground org or ground troops, our org is focused on ground combat, right? That's why we do this podcast. Um, an essential part of that is is getting to the ground. So we do have to rely on pilots. We do have pilots in our org, very skilled pilots on both ends. It seems to be, that's the meta, right? Because it's all the players like to fly ships, and that's okay. Um, but we have focused a lot lately on developing our own ground transport pilots, our, our ground drop ships excuse me, dropship piloting. Um, and so we just happened to come across your videos on YouTube. And the reason we like you is because you break it down very analytically, very detail-oriented. So I wanted to give you the floor um, and just kind of give us your history. You know, How did you find Star Citizen? How long you been playing? Like what kind of background do you have? And how you ended up being a dropship pilot? And also give us, you know, tell us what org you're in too because I think you might have a few listeners at this point that are tuning in. <laughs> so go ahead. So, yeah, yeah, no, I appreciate that. So I'll start with, I am in Atlas Defense Industries. You can go to adiclan.com. Uh, we are one of the largest, I think we are the largest white hat org. And um, which means we, we're the good guys. We don't do piracy. Um, and yeah, I mean, we, we have this same challenge. We work through it. Um, I've been there since pretty much the beginning of Star Citizen. Right. But if we rewind how I even got with this group, um, it actually started back when I was doing a lot of sim racing. So I used to sim race at a very high level, um, you know, to the point where you can put in so much time, it's unhealthy. Every little change mm -hmm. uh, you make, you know, the strategy you use, you can dump hours into it. And I really enjoy that. I've raced some real cars and I got to race with some really amazing people. Um, in fact, one of them is actually a dev at uh, CIG now. I won't say who it is, but um, yeah. Uh, so it's just kind of a small world, but that was a really stressful world. And as much as I enjoyed it, I couldn't do it for fun. Like it was like, I'm going there to win and I have a purpose and I'm prepared and every week is a new track. And so it's this never relaxing kind of atmosphere. And right. I realized that I wasn't gaming for fun. So I needed to do something that I enjoyed. And I randomly picked up a game called Battlefield 1942. You ever played that? I know I'm familiar with it, but I've never played. So it's it's all about World War II, and you can do everything from fly aircraft to get on these big guns and mm -hmm. pound the shores with them. I mean, it's just, it's ridiculous, right? And I had this really uh, specific moment that kind of drew me into combat. Uh, I had dropped in out of a parachute. I think this was supposed to simulate me coming in out of a, a plane, but I literally just appeared in the sky falling down with a parachute. I get down on the ground. 
Uh, I'm going out with several other people. I have no idea what's going on. And I'm just following some people around, and I see they're kind of moving this way, that way. We get to a bridge. Um, everyone's going across the bridge. Now, I'm thinking this is, you know, a dangerous situation, but I don't even know the context of are we in good guy territory? Are we bad? I have no idea what's going on, right? And as we're going across the bridge, a tank comes the other way, which I presumed because he was shooting at us that he was the bad guy, right? As and, one does. Yeah. Uh, I saw, right, right. Yeah. I saw a Jeep. Uh, from my side come over and hit it and they both exploded and the epiphany for me was i'm now in a world where things can be used differently and this combat was sort of chaos but fun and i really really enjoyed it but i was motivated when i saw how much impact the aerial guys could have on those maps because it was kind of a capture the flag thing if i remember correctly and so you're trying to gain and hold territory and the air assets could really do a lot of things that were so timely and amazing that helped the ground forces. So I spent time mm. doing that. I worked through Battlefield Vietnam. Uh, Battlefield 2 was really a, a major thing because you could have squads. Did you ever play Battlefield 2? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you could organize a lot right? better, right? Yeah, you could have the squads and they could call out the tanks when they were coming in to the, to the capture point. I could, you know, drop bombs on the tank. I could hear the guys be excited and happy. And I just felt like, you know, I'd achieved something. And I kind of was permanently addicted to flying. Um, now, at that time, my thoughts on flying were really based on that. And that's really arcadey. It's not a lot of skill. There's some skill. But really, you don't learn ship systems. You don't get into complicated things. You're, mm -hmm. you're almost like FPSing it. You're kind of pointing and shooting, right? Yeah, I mean, in, in so, any arcade game, right? That's that's the, it's the simplified version of whatever you're doing. But what? Yeah, but can I, I still love the teamwork. Well, yeah, the teamwork. Yeah. That's what I was getting to. Is that that's the biggest pull for you then? Because we know you're a dropship oh. pilot now. That's why you're here. But is that the biggest pull for you? Is like being that support element from the sky that just does it for you. So. The teamwork aspect is really nice. And, um, you know, when I would hear guys, because later on I went into Arma as well, and I would infill and exfill with a little bird and do a lot of other things. Hearing the guys on the radio excited because I'm coming in to help them or because I did a proper cast mission or I got them the hell out of there when it was hot. Um, yeah, all of that's there because it gives you a context. It gives you a reason, in my mind, to develop your skills. It gives you a meaning and purpose beyond just hey look i can i can fly around because to me um that can be enjoying if you just want to relax and, and you don't want to have to think too much but if i'm going to enjoy something i want mm. that context i want that um rooted reason to be there you know that team play yeah that's fulfilling it's a fulfilling thing like yeah. knowing that you aided in something crucial right um so sorry i, I didn't yeah, mean to interrupt absolutely. you keep going but that was just oh. my question so uh, the the Battlefield group I was with, they went into a new game that didn't have flying assets. And so I kind of floundered and I found a game called Arma, which I'm sure you guys are familiar with. Yeah. Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah, we okay. love Arma. So <laughs> Arma's got great ground combat, but the flying assets are, well, they leave a lot to be desired. Yeah. Um, and they, they have some extra challenges because they don't have some of the fidelity in some of the systems. So from there, I actually met, uh, it was Task Force 88, uh, which turned into the Star Citizen work that I'm in now. Mm. And I developed more skills. We had more uh, in context. It was more realistic. Um, you know, your actions were less consistent. Like in, on, in Battlefield, you're just constantly shooting something, right? But yeah. in Arma, it's slowed down a little bit. Your ordnance placement is more important for that specific moment because you can't just go rearm super quick, right? You could yeah. be several clicks away from the base. And then a helicopter, that could take you some time, right? And, and your guys are depending on you. So um, we ended up transitioning from there to um, Star Citizen. And uh, I actually was concerned at first that I might not make the, transi the transition, excuse me, because I I'd been through groups before where they'd gone somewhere else and I wasn't interested. And I didn't know much about Star Citizen. And spaceships didn't interest me, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. um, 
But when I learned more about Star Citizen, I actually discovered uh, that it could be the Holy Grail. And <laughs> by that, I mean Absolutely. that... Uh, so now I, I do a lot of DCS and BMS, so very high fidelity flight sims where you learn the systems and the subsystems and oh, how yeah. to use a targeting pod and putting in precise grid coordinates and just it's a really, really complicated system, right? Mm -hmm. But it has no ground combat. There are AI... And you can have people down there controlling some of the AI, but it's not the same as guys yelling and cheering. The AI don't care if they live or die, right? They, yeah. they just, they're just you know silent. So to me, I really get the enjoyment out of the DCS uh, group that I'm with from the flying uh, perspective. But Star Citizen offers the only thing I know of that's going to potentially give enough fidelity in both to make it really, really interesting if they do a couple things that we need. Yeah. So my background started with sim racing, kind of moved into flying for fun, got more into teamwork. And then, you know, the groups I was with developed into Star Citizen. And we went from a small group of probably, you know, 20 or 30 to 7,800 and we're massive now. So nice. that's kind of been my arc with gaming and flying. Um, I can talk to you a little bit about why I do the dropship stuff in Star Citizen, but it's kind of related yeah. to what we talked about already. Yeah, and that's that's kind of what we want to flesh out on the podcast um, because we're, we're trying to build that out. We're always open to like bouncing ideas off of people and, and making partnerships and alliances um, in that regard and kind of cross-training. <clears throat> but w what attracted us to you was the, the simplicity of your videos um, if you haven't looked up, look up Callie Joshua on YouTube and you'll, you'll find his stuff there, his content. And you just started a, uh, I mean, when I say just started, I mean like maybe February or March, right? You started a series of, uh, dropship piloting tutorials. Is that correct? Yeah. And you know, it's funny. I started that series, um, and I wanted to do the third video in that series first, but then I realized that I'm using the TVI, uh, the little indicator on the ship, to do some of the things I'm doing. I made a discovery of why certain things work a certain way with the speed break and boost, and we can talk about that quickly if you want. Yeah, and in. then I got to make my, my video because I realized that there's some baseline skills that uh, if you don't know, you might not be able to follow along. Right? I didn't want to leave people with, with a hole in that plan. Dude, that's what we like about it because – it's uh, from the ground level. It's uh, it's the full encompassing tutorial. So I'm excited to see where you take it and how you build on those building blocks. But yeah, break it down. If you're a dropship pilot, like what's step one for these guys? Obviously, find your tutorials. That's step one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's step yeah. one. Watch all of my videos Watch all of them. from beginning to end. No. <laughs> but like, um, let's say I just logged into um, the game. I'm going to go and... Uh, you, you, when I watched your thing, I went straight to the menu and I was like, do I have these on set? I'm like, I think I had all of them except for the TVI always on. I didn't even know that was a setting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the hardest and the first thing to do is to undo some of the things that, uh, star citizen has just completely in the goofiest state possible. If you go in the game right now and I use a joystick, so a hotel setup. But if you bind the throttle forward and you push the throttle forward, your ship's actually going to go backwards. Yeah. Right. So you have to go into another menu and change that. Um, you know, so you really need to watch the video I have. What is it? Uh, 3.14 default settings that can kill you or something like that. Oh, yeah. um, and really, I'm just trying to share with people how to undo those things and then watch my joystick setup video if you're going to use that. And that'll help you be able to at least fly in the directions you intend, which is step one, and that your joystick or whatever peripheral you're using is working the way you want. But to answer the question you mean in terms of what do you want to do as a dropship pilot? Yeah. I think you you want to pick a ship, and, and here's why. I, I have lapses between when I do some of these videos, and I'm trying to do uh, with the Vanguard series, the Valkyrie, I'm going to do some stuff with the Pisces. I think that's a very, very important ship that you cannot overlook. And there's some very specific reasons for that. But when I switch between ships, it takes me a moment to get up to speed on what I'm supposed to do for them. And if I haven't done it regularly, uh, like it's been probably two or three weeks since I flew any of that stuff, 
it's going to take me a good 20, 30 minutes to get that skill back up. So pick one ship, pick a drop ship that you want to use and master it. That's step one, in my opinion, because once you do that, you're going to build the baseline skills and know how to take that into a competitive situation or a combat situation. So to me, uh, I've done real racing and real competition. I always break things down into their individual steps. So like a race car driver picks their braking point and where they steer in. And so when you're doing that in the track, you're breaking down the little individual components you need to be successful. So as a dropship pilot, I tried to show an approximate height because we don't have a radar, a radar altimeter. I tried to show a specific speed. I tried to show a spot where on the dash you line it up so you can just reverse everything, land and pick up your people very quickly. So I break it down into individual steps because that's how I know to, to do things. So step one is to pick your ship and then start getting to know what speeds the different things I've shown are and how you can adjust them because what... I'm trying to show in my video is one way to do it and a solid procedure. How much you push it, whether you initiate the braking distance at the distance I show you or a few hundred meters quicker, um, or I'm sorry, later, so you're in there quicker, that's up to you, but you're going to give yourself less decision reaction time and orientation to the landing mm -hmm. zone and where the combat's coming from. So I try to show something that gives you a little bit of extra time to orient and do stuff. Now, if you were doing this purely for like an air show, yeah, you'd push it right to the limit and, you know, you would uh, have your stopping point, you know, be right on edge and maybe possibly blow through, right? Take that risk. Um, so to answer your question, I, I think it really comes down to being able to have the discipline to work with one thing and a set of skills to develop it. Because that's what I started with. That's and I think that's really important. Couldn't agree more, man. I like that a lot. Um, and yeah, I'm with you on that. It's like pick a ship... And you just get familiar with it. And the more you do so, you end up mm -hmm. getting a level of mastery on that thing. And um, I don't know how you guys do it. And uh, what was your org called again? I'm going to write this down. So it's I Atlas it. Defense Industries. Atlas Defense, that's right. Okay, so yep. in Atlas, um, I don't know if you guys have one dedicated dropship or multiple, but uh, we, and we've stated this on our podcast before, we are open to, <laughs> to jump uh, as ground infantry guys, we're open and ready to jump out of anything that fits the mission. If we have to ride in a prospector for some reason to get there, if that's the play, <laughs> we'll jump out of yeah. it. You know, it's, it's, uh, we're ready for it, but that's an extreme, but you know, so we, we, we have a, a different approach, um, and how we qualify or how we get people familiar with ships. Uh, we do a, a qualification system and we're just implementing this now, but, um, a, a transport pilot, if they want to slot for that billet for, you know, let's say we have an operation or a, a PVP thing coming up in a month, we fill those slots early so we can all plan and prep for it. But um, so we have, a, if you want to be a dropship pilot, then you have to be, we, we kind of pick what ship is going to be done. We start the planning process and we say, okay, it's going to be this ship. So then they have to qualify on that ship in order to fly for that particular mission, if that makes sense. But it all comes down to that yeah, same so, baseline of being familiar. So we have a couple ships, but our our, our baseline is like the Cuddy Black or the Valkyrie. Those two. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah, so at Atlas Defense Industries, um, you know, we're trying to do the hard thing. And that is what more than you can do on your own. And with 7,800 members, you're hurting a lot of cats. And you have a lot of different people with different backgrounds and different countries. So we're going to have certifications where you meet um, an objective standard uh, or you take a certification class. And that way, whether you're the guy on the ground or you know whatever position you need, you need a gunner, they got that cert, you know they have a basic minimum skill set, right? Right. And so, yeah, absolutely the same thing. And that's that's a uh, integral part. It's, it's not easy to codify that and to schedule the training and get the you know, the NCOs or trainers to make all of that happen. Yeah. But it's absolutely critical for combat effect, effective, effectiveness. And we, we agree too. We've, we've done that in the past in our previous orgs and in some podcasts we've done in the past, we kind of, we kind of harp on that and we, we don't quite necessarily agree with the certification part because we're taking a different approach in our org of, we have a gatekeeper and we want to stay small and we want to stay, quality but we we tried in past orgs to be the big 
guys like you guys. We were trying to be seven, eight hundred like you. <laughs> but we, we went with a smaller approach this time. So there's a lot of ways to bake this cake. But the underlying thing I think you and I would agree on with dropship piloting in specific, is it such a crucial role to enable everyone's gameplay? You just have to have the right person on the sticks. Would you agree with that? Like that's the most important. Yeah, thing. and I, I think it's not only just the right person with the right skills, but it's understanding the context and what your value is in that moment. Is it a cast role? Um, because you may need to soften the target before you drop people in. The Valkyrie has a lot of guns that may be able to help with that. Right. Um, you know, when, when I'm talking about a, a dropship pilot and what I'm doing, um, I'm talking about a hot LZ under high pressure. That's I'm not what talking, we're talking about, about just coming into a landing zone. Right, right exactly. I want to make that that's, clear. That's our, that's clear our that life. We're on the same page. Yes, yes. yes. I mean, that's because right, so, that's a really all that matters, right? If, if we could... Let's let's expound on that real, real quick before I don't want to interrupt you, but it, that's all that really okay. matters, right? Because any pilot, if you're not under pressure, you can go down and land and kick troops out, like however you want. However you want. You want. Yep. When when time is on your side and you have time and proper security, it doesn't really matter. You can just take your time and land a C two and deploy a whole battalion if you wanted, right? Um, <laughs> but yeah. we're talking in specific, and I, I'm glad that you brought this up because we've talked about it. We call it Dart. That's our acronym for Direct Action Rapid Response Tactics. Makes us sound cool when we say sure. it. Sure, yeah. But that's what it is. We want to yeah, get... Acronyms. Yeah, because like you and I, like we have lives. Like uh, you told me earlier before we started, you're a professional cyclist, which is awesome. But like you, ha your time is well, not a professional, but... Oh, well, I mean, if you're, if you're amateur, more than a cyclist I, I, than me, you're I a race. professional. <laughs> <laughs> so you're a professional in my yeah, mind. yeah. Um, but the point is your, sure, your we'll time is it. scarce, right? And so when you have, we do a PVP yeah. group, it's like you have 90 minutes to get this objective done. So you, we can't bide our time. You have to fly in hot and land troops close to the objective so they can play. <laughs> right. So I'm There's glad you brought that up. There's one other critical factor to that. Oh yeah. Hit it. There's one other critical factor to that. It's fun. Yes. And for me, <laughs> I love the challenge. Thank you. <laughs> like, you know. Yeah, it's way fun. I love that challenge. On all and ends, it's way fun. The Yeah, exactly. But understanding that role as a cast pilot or as a dropship pilot, and whether you're performing casts, whether you're just trying to get guys in or out or supplies in or out, where do you need them? How do you get into the right position? It's, that's actually where this whole thing started. Um, we had a challenge where we had some guys on the ground that were landing too close to objects. They couldn't open the door. Um, and so I do more than just dropship pilot stuff for our group, but I had this, you know, brought up and I said, well, how do I solve this problem? And I came up with the precision landing techniques I show in that one video where you come in at a certain speed and a certain altitude and it lines up, you hit the brakes and you hit your throttles to zero, hit the brakes and you'll land right about where you need to every time. Pretty consistent, right? So, you know, try to determine how you need to use your ship and your skills that's a fun challenge. You're not going to always get it right. Um, I do think that uh, it's only something that's going to come with experience. And, and one of the things that's the future of my series is um, I, I do I do have a quick announcement, if, if I can. Yeah, go ahead. Absolutely. So, so far, we've covered the TVI, the speed brake versus boost, the uh, precision landing techniques, and then a full speed landing. Those are the main things we've covered. Um, but I actually have an even faster way to get on the ground. So I can bring you in even closer and stop you even faster. It takes more skill. Uh, it's a little bit of a challenge, um, but you can do that quicker. And all of these things have yet to be really tested because we don't have the proper context. If you're listening, Star Citizen, we really love more things and you could make it as simple as capture the flag, it doesn't even have to be PVE, it could be PVP, but we need that extra challenge to test these things because the future of this series is going to be, for me, taking a ship into the different roles and challenges, some of them set up to see if it can, you know, under the worst case scenario to see what we can do, and then some of it just set up in a more realistic uh, scenario and kind of play out because, as I've said in my videos, I don't know that I know it all. I've developed some techniques 
Um, I think they're they're achieving my goal of flying in low and fast and getting into a precise location. But how they work in combat, how that works with a Marine group in need, that's still a question mark that needs to be explored, right? Mm. And I know you guys, I think, have done some more work with that, and I plan to do some. But until you really get that out there in a big way against the entire um, verse of people, you know, no matter what tactics you get, you're really going to need to test it PvP and see. So oh, for me, the big, sorry. I just said I was just in agreement. Absolutely. Yeah. There's a lot, yeah. a lot, so a for, lot of missing pieces. And we're like, how do we connect these? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We could talk about those if you want to open that up. But, yeah. Why not? Um, you know, Okay. Well, yeah, well, finish your for, thought, though. To, just we'll... to close the, the, yeah, just to close this out, if you are motivated by teamwork, if you enjoy a challenge, if you need a reason to develop a skill, I think being a dropship pilot is very different. The popular thing right now is to be a combat pilot. And look, you can go to Hangar Ready on YouTube and I help host a podcast for Atlas Defense Industries. I also am part of the Fighter Mafia, which is specifically looking at air-to-air -air combat and how you use a fighter pilot or a lead and a wingman to work together as a team. You see a lot of individual fighting, um, but you don't see a lot of teamwork fighting. Um, but this particular aspect, the dropship pilot, I think hopefully with Pyro and the future is going to become more necessary but I don't know if a lot of people are developing the skills. Um, they, they take time. They're not as exciting as shooting another aircraft in the moment because we don't have that same combat. But I would challenge you that it's a difficult skill to master. I agree. We've been really working hard. We've set a high bar within the privateers for pilots to, ch to check it out and try it. And we have two or three, four guys total that are uh, being considered like to do that. Um, and you're right, man. Like there is a void it's needed because let's be honest, um, unless you're in an org like ours or yours at the Atlas with 700 people, um, a lot of people play star citizen in very small groups of two to three, you know, four, maybe yeah. five, but even then, like, it's just very rare, few and far between where you're going to have a dedicated dropship pilot, unless you have a squad of six to 12 in the back of there. Right. Um, that's if player cap limiting, because <laughs> if you're doing PVP and it's 25 <laughs> V 25, it's like, where do you juggle yeah. your assets? How much, how many air assets do you have? Like, do you have enough rifles on the ground to like actually take their defenses or do whatever's needed? So it's like this constant, we're just moving this slider of 25. Like, uh, do we have 10 sliders or do we have, do we have 20? Like, do we all in fighters or are we what? Like, um, but yeah, so when player cap, cap increases, then I think more orgs will be like pushing some major dropship stuff. But right now it's kind of, it's like on the back burner. So I, I agree with you. Like nobody is really doing like mm -hmm. developing skills for this because it's kind of, it's almost irrelevant unless you're in an orc that's doing this, right? Um, well, I think there's two, two things I'd like to say to that. One... Mm -hmm. uh, I think this game is very clearly catering towards having teammates. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think with all the different ship types and refueling, and they've stated that, you know, in uncontrolled space, you're going to probably have your more lucrative areas, but you're also going to have to provide all of your needs, all of your security, all the human needs, right? All of your ship yeah, needs. Logistics, um, everything. And that's not something that's, yeah. You're going to have to have a logistic super house to, to do that, right? Mm -hmm. And then two, I think, we're looking at a skill set where it's not just about you. If you have a Valkyrie, what does a Valkyrie hold? 24 people? Something. I just call it Isn't a shitload. It it's a shitload of dudes. You should. A lot of shitload. <laughs> <laughs> a shitload of dudes. If you got a shitload of dudes in the back of your ship and you pile drive that thing into the ground and kill everyone, uh, you know, you didn't do your responsibility as a pilot. So <laughs> you failed yeah. to take on a dropship role. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is more than just you as a fighter pilot got shot down. You, you're, you're affecting your crew and, and their livelihood. If you're coming to exfil a group and you, you know, don't make it, well, you might as well not even have been in your ship because to them, you are not a useful asset in that arena. Yeah. So I think it is catering to our orgs. 
And I think it's a, you got to want it because there is no instant reward right now. No one is going to come in and say, yeah, you did a good job. You can't just go into a server and, you know, suddenly infill guys and have some fun. It doesn't exist that way. Right. Yeah. So there's a lot of it, setup. It is kind of niche. I'm yeah. sorry. But because that. Star Citizen could be the holy grail, I practice and figured, you yes. know what, I'll share it with people. Why not? I'm in the same mindset because yeah, there's it's, it takes a lot of setup to get guys uh, to, to fly with you and, and to go do a bunker or whatever. But yeah, it's no instant reward. I find that wishing there was, and I think the answer is theaters of war. Cause that everything you mentioned earlier was uh, there's a capture. Like we need capture the flag. Like we need these, we need this theater of war to test all of our shit <laughs> and to test these tactics and to really hone those skills to come in and do a landing. And I would even venture to say, this is my guess. Your next video is about, uh, I, I don't know what you would call it, but I would call it a flaring technique to come to a stop. Uh, you've, been, you've been paying attention been to paying my videos. Attention. Yes. I had some that, hints in there. That is my, <laughs> yeah, it's it's in your, your first clip you show. <laughs> That's a beautiful Valkyrie yes. flare, by the way. <laughs> so, yeah, the flaring is something that we're teaching our guys right now. We'll let your video come out and expound upon it. But, man, that is such a fast way to get that big, unruly bitch of a Valkyrie on the ground or a Cuddy or anything because those bottom thrusters are just so powerful in, in stopping you. But that's what we need. Is we well, need I'll be so curious there. what... Oh, sorry, go ahead. What you think of my technique. Yeah, I'll be curious what you think oh, of dude. my technique and if you guys find something useful in it. Oh, I've, I've already found like a dozen things. I'm actually really excited to like do some training with you. I think we should put our heads together and just go swap ideas whether our orgs become friend or not, you know, like the, uh, what is it? The Montagues and the whatever families that are feuding. We'll be Romeo and Juliet, bro. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. And me. We'll go swap all of our dropship ideas. But um, <laughs> I've already taken like four or five, maybe more, probably more things from your videos alone. Like the settings. Um, and I had forgotten about the space break canceling thrust because I, I I don't even have a space break bound right now because I'm well, just straight boost. But yeah, yeah. So it cancels your strafe, and it makes it so that your pitch only changes orientation. It doesn't change elevation mm -hmm. at all, which actually is the only reason the flare technique works because it locks you on a vector, and now your ship is doing everything possible to stay on that vector and slow you down at the same time. Yes. So you're kind of using um, an assist, if you will, because mm. I've tried it without that, and it's not going to happen. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, if you have, if you're unless you're flying decoupled, I guess you could get it to do the same thing because you're kind mm -hmm. of locked on a vector. But yeah, if you're not decoupled, if you're flying with assist on, <laughs> and you make that turn without uh, tapping your speed brake or at least locking it in for a second, yeah, because like I, when I watched your video. I like probably a month ago. I recently rebound my my space break, so it's on my left stick. I fly dual stick, and I have my left hand canted, okay. so it's like a throttle, but it's just more okay. Because yeah. I'm I'm used to dual sticks. So I was like, man, that's the best of both worlds. But it's a it's a pullback, and then I pull the left trigger as my brake, so it feels like I'm pulling a a cycling brake, like a bike brake that you'd probably <laughs> you're like. Oh. Yep. So anyway, um, but yeah, when, <laughs> yeah. You, when you flip your nose over and then tap that thing, you really just lock into that slide and you can stop on a dime. So I'm excited to see what you got with that video because, I mean, all that stuff, the, the foundation you're laying with your videos is like that. That's just it. It's the foundation that you're laying with those videos. A basic pilot, we could say, hey, go watch Callie Joshua's videos um, and leave a comment on there so we know you did it. Right. Or whatever. Yeah. Um, so they go watch it and they're like, okay, so I got this down and then we kind of test them out and like, okay, you can fly it. Now we're going to building block just layer upon layer, uh, excuse me, of their skill set. Um, and that's what was the most intriguing thing about you. Cause we're like, we're building our dropship procedures right now. And when I say we build things in the privateers, we like, I have a eight page document and I'm not even done about transport piloting. Like, we we write stuff down. <laughs> we archive the shit out of it. We have yeah. our own wiki on our own web page. Um, and no one's ever going to read it fully, except a handful of people, mm -hmm. the guys that like you and me who want to read that stuff. But 
um, it's there. So we have this baseline, you know, and so we're building it and we're like, dude, this guy, we're like, he's, that's like what we're talking about. <laughs> we're like, what's the distance between this shit? So and Echo messaged me. He's like, yeah, so it, <laughs> sorry, go ahead. Yeah. It's funny. I, I, I saw someone responded in my comments. I think it was Echo. And he asked me if I wanted to join. I'm like, I don't know who this group is. Let me take a look. And oh, I started watching you guys' podcast. And I haven't. That was me. Oh, yeah. was it you? Okay. So I, I haven't watched all of it. I think one of you hit me up on Twitter, which is yeah, Cali Echo Joshua hit you 63 because Cali Joshua the, was taken. Yeah, I left the comment and then Echo hit you up on Twitter. I was like, yeah. That's okay. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so when I started watching this, I was like, well, why would they want me to be a part of my project? That, no offense. I do this as a passion project and I'm doing the content that I want to do. <laughs> I could do content that I think would get a lot more views and oh. be more popular and grow my channel. Agreed. We but agreed. I, so my whole channel, I do peripherals. So I have a profile set up for the Warthog and the T16,000, which is an unbelievable amount of work to do. Um, I actually fly with a modified Warthog. Um, and I want to be able to bring something that's substance. And, and I got probably the best compliment that I've had um, recently where someone said, you know, this is the kind of content we need. I'm like, well, I, I, I feel that way, but I don't know how many other people do. And just because I think that my stuff is good doesn't mean that it is because, you know, my perception could be way off from the rest of the world. But <laughs> I'm not going to knock people who want to fly in and enjoy Star Citizen however they want. Look, it's, it's a free verse. Do what you want. But if you're interested in combat, if you're interested in these things, then, you know, your guys is when I was watching your podcast, I'm like, oh, I get it. I understand completely why I liked your guys' dynamic. And I thought this is this is a good fit. And I was I'm happy to be here. I think, you know, we may need to do some more and I'd happy happily work with you guys and test some things. Um, you know, I will say and, you know, just because I'm here representing also the work I'm with, sure. we do these things as well. And we have leadership positions and people that are working this problem and um you guys had a video about how you do your um sharing of um uh, items and i think it was you're using a backpack and i sent it to one of our guys on our marine team who was working at that and he's like yeah we had figured that out too so i'm like okay yeah. so maybe we're on the right the right stretch because i i really don't know everything our marine guys are doing right now i have my own world i live in in this bigger org and so it was really cool to see those kind of similarities and you know, I, I I wish more people were interested. I wish it was something that, you know, uh, uh, was more popular. But I do think Star Citizen could do that. And, and, you know, sitting here thinking about it, you know, they have these derelict ships. Have derelict ships that pop up where some guy calls for a rescue and he says, hey, I've got all this expensive cargo and I'm an X and everyone can accept it. And now all of a sudden you yeah. have a challenge. You have a reason, a purpose speed becomes important organization becomes important not only are you going to be able to have to have combat troops to take it over but now you got to have the logistical capability to get that junk out of there and back to your base so you can sell it or whatever yes. right so you start to get multiple layers and to me being in a big org and seeing our org ops and how things are going to work um i, I love chaos i love it when things are crazy and there's a lot <laughs> going on and, you know, you have multiple elements at one time and one thing depends on the next thing and you're playing your role. I don't know. To me, that's my happy place. Right. So uh, I don't know. We, we need a purpose for these things to happen. We need yes. something in there that, that drives it. You know what I mean? Like hold a point for like how many organizations do you think can hold a point for four hours, six hours, 10 hours? How long can you sustain an operation? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. There's all these different things that would be so awesome, but we just don't have them. Right. Yeah. And like we, uh, if you saw some of our earlier episodes, we talk about how we're missing tools that would enable some of this gameplay. And we've harped on them a lot. What but, tools? Yeah. Like uh, from a ground perspective, right? Um, a better radio system. Hopefully they vamped that up. It would be nice to, <laughs> to hail a dropship that was part of my yeah. org, right? And, and then give them a coordinate or a mark or something. That way you can use all the We don't even have build. basic navigation. We don't. We don't I have a compass. I can't do waypoints. No, well, no waypoints. I can't. I don't, <laughs> the ground guys, we don't have a compass. <laughs> Like it wasn't until like a couple months ago we got like actual ship compasses, you know, on on the HUD, 
Um, so stuff like that. But like, well, let me give you a pilot. Yeah, give me a pilot rundown. What are we missing from a pilot, uh, especially in particular a dropship pilot? Yeah, so I'm going under the dropship role. I'm going to include cast, just just yeah. so that we're clear. Um, a support dropship is very specific, getting marines in and out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I use the term dropship because it just makes the most sense. Mm-hmm. But you know, I I try not to laugh at CIG. I know they are trying. I am a big backer. I've been a, a part of this for a long time. I believe I will drink all the Kool Aid you want. I buy ships now and again, even when I probably shouldn't, because I want to support the program. But we Same. are missing some of the most basic things. And when they do add something, they have a lack of a foundation. And let me explain. So, about 1980, an F-16 pilot could look. And in the um, heads-up display in his helmet, all right, he could look at a target, push a button on his joystick, and lock that target. And he could look away and look back, and that target was still locked for a missile or a gunshot or whatever. If you use missile operator mode right now, if you look away, it goes away. And the reason I think this occurs, as someone said this in my org, and so it's not my original thought on this one, is that they think that that lock is tied to the head of the, of the actual player and not a radar system, because we don't have a radar that makes sense, and I'll explain. So I can do a 360 scan of an area and ping and see all the little topo ripples of every little thing out there on the map, right? But I don't know how my ship's radar works. What is the cone of effectiveness? I can have a little thing on my dash that says that the guy's over here, but I can't lock him up and have a missile stay there and look away for one second and I lose this lock. And why is that important? Because of situational awareness. Because you can't just be target-focused the entire time. And it shows that they don't have a foundation of a radar system that's Mm -hmm. getting the lock and then something else that's actually trying to work with that, like a missile and a seeker head. And how does this affect pilots on the ground? Well, if I am up in the air and you're getting, you know, your rear end handed to you by a squadron or some tonk or whatever is down there, how are you going to tell me? First of all, it's you're Im- not because we don't have comms unless we're all. It's impossible. We don't even have smoke grenades. Right. We don't have anything to mark for you so, as a pilot. No. So let's say you could. Let's say we had a radio system where we could switch some channels around and, you know, you could say, hey, um, go to the Marines. They're on, you know, whatever channel. Boom. I change channel. I go there. And you say, hey, we're getting our butts kicked. Uh, we got a tank here. Great. Where's here? Right. I exactly. don't, you can't give me a grid coordinate. Nope. Right. Now this could be another form of gameplay to go to a strange planet. That's never been mapped. you got to put some satellites up. you got to map it. You got, this is an org function. Yeah. You know what I mean? So that you have that grid coordinate, some, some way of doing it. That'd be a fine game mechanic. Right. But even if you could tell me where it is now, I need to do something as a pilot that is very difficult for cast. I need to identify my friendly from my foes. I need to know where you are, where they are, and I need to know what is the safe path to come in and what's a safe direction to shoot so I don't shoot you, right? Mm -hmm. So we need some form of a targeting pod. We need lasers on the ground. And and this could be simple. It doesn't have to be complicated like DCS. It could be that, like, you have a little attachment on your rifle because this is a 1,000 years in the future. It sends a laser signal, lights up the tank, and boom, now I know where it is and I can go kill them, right? You've got to have the basic steps for a pilot to have communication, uh, threat orientation, and give them the ability to decide how they're going to attack that problem in the best way to kill the bad guy and not kill the good guy. I mean, those are the absolute basics and we don't have them. And even if we, even without those, do you know what the detection range is of like a top tank from uh, any ship? It's... Way more than it should be. I don't know the exact figure, but if I'm remembering correctly, it's like thir- It's almost 30 clicks. It's like ridiculous. I know the dragon for a, tank? for a tank, for a ship to tank. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For a ship, yeah, yeah. For a ship in, in the space or up in the sky, to detecting a ground vehicle. Detecting, oh, okay, wait. It depends on the ground vehicle, though. So I know that dragonflies come yes, hot. The dragonflies are like any of the the maglev or whatever, the gravlev technology, like the yeah. bikes, those come in hot. Um, ground vehicles d- 
don't as much though, because you can drop a cyclone over Jumptown from like atmosphere and it won't get detected mm-hmm. as it falls. So I don't know what a tank so, is specifically. Yeah, I can't. It's like it's like twelve hundred meters, five hundred oh, right. meters. It's okay. ridiculous. Like, well, guess what the range a, of a tank a is? A ballista, a ballistic, twelve hundred meters. <laughs> right, right, right. A ballistic can light. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A ballistic can light me up from twenty clicks out, but I can't light up until I'm fifteen hundred. Now, yeah, I get it. They don't want air vehicles to dominate the battle space, but I'm here to tell you a secret. Do you know the last time the United States military lost any ground troops to foreign or enemy air assets? Ooh, I want to say Vietnam, but I'm going to say before that. World War II. I think it was Korea, if I'm understanding. Yeah, I think it was Korea, actually. And we have had air dominance since. So here, here's the reality. And here's the truth that no one wants to hear. If you're a shit pilot... If your org has shit pilots and you want to do stuff on the ground, you don't have to look much farther than current events in the world to understand what's going to happen to you. Yep. You're going to get pummeled. So you Absolutely. better invest in some combat pilots and you better have pilots that can take out those ground troops and those vehicles if you want dominance. And the the, the determining factor can't just be that, oh, we're going to artificially limit your ability to detect that vehicle from distance. No, because yes, you need all of them together. But ground vehicles, left to air vehicles, are picked off like fish in a barrel. Oh, absolutely. And that's why uh, we we focus so much on the ground. We know that is 100% our weakness. So we've partnered with a group called the Mighty 8th. They're a virtual air force. But in Star Citizen, they're the Mm -hmm. Mighty 8th Mercantile Security and Mercantile and Security Services. Um, But they're, they're awesome guys, and they got some great pilots. Uh, there's a lot of great pilots out there, but they hold their own and they get us on the ground and they protect us. So that's all we can ask from them. And I'm sure you guys have pilots. But isn't that a fun thing. dynamic? It is though. It's, it's the only game where it's truly happening and it's not even fully fleshed out yet. So I can't say right. truly, but it, 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 you're like you said, it's, it's the potential Holy grail for this kind of gameplay. And this, this connection mm-hmm. of true air to true ground you know, like that that handshake. It's like the uh, the painting that what is it, Da Vinci or whoever painted, where they're like touching fingers. <laughs> it's like that. Oh yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I know. What you it's know, called. I'll tell you a quick story if you don't mind. Yeah, go for it. So, we were doing some pop up missions, and we were trying to make it exciting for our guys, and we wanted to give them a challenge. And so, I started to lead a mission, and I was with in a Super Hornet. Uh, with another Super Hornet as my wingman. We had a Valkyrie coming in with some Marines, and they had a um, Ursa Rover in there, right? Now, we're just going to go do a bunker mission, something you can do with a much smaller group, okay? But when we got there, the uh, Ursa had a broken wheel and couldn't move, something about an issue while it flew. No big deal. So we go to take out the um, turrets, because that was going to be our job. Uh, We were putting our shields forward, uh, overclocking the shields at that time and, you know, coming in with our guns, taking out the turrets. Well, there was a bug that the turrets would instantly respawn and you could not provide the kind of air protection to make it so that the ship could come in uh, without the turrets and be safer, right? Which was the ideal scenario. So we had to improvise and say, hey, listen, we're going to start blasting these turrets. You're going to come in and get that ship in quick, get those guys out and into there. And when we did that at the same time and the Marines on the ground saw us taking out turrets as they were running in, they said that was the most fun they ever had. And seeing that dynamic and multiple assets working together, that's the gameplay experience that can give Star Citizen the longevity. Because now as a Marine, you might be inspired to try something else. And if they give more depth and skills to the systems we need, that gives you more things to train to. And that will give this the kind of longevity that I think can make this game last a very long time. Agreed. But without it, we're kind of stuck in this, yeah. you know what I mean? And I've been that guy on the ground and I've been delivered in some crazy stuff. And we got some cool footage we could share with uh, the, the YouTube community. But like that is undeniably like my coolest top, top moments of star citizen have been in that, that type of situation. I've also been the guy dropping them off, you know, in a few, it was kind of ran, random. We didn't have the systems we have now, but it was like, just get on the stick and go and, you know, and, and it works. But 
Yeah, those moments is what keeps people playing the game and what keeps you coming back for more. It what ma- it's what makes all the tedium of managing your inventory and organizing call these cats and dogs like you were saying. All that tedium <laughs> of getting everybody at the right place at the right time with the right equipment. And then it, it launches off like this beautiful fucking orchestra of music. And you're just like, oh my God, when are we doing this again? <laughs> but we are yeah. currently, Joshua, we are creating that gameplay almost 100% for ourselves right now. I mean, you can go have that experience at a PVE bunker right now, but anything above that, like the moments I've had, we were fully created in player versus player missions that so much time Mm -hmm. and effort have gone to. So I just totally agree with you. We're just missing a lot of context and a lot of missing uh, puzzle pieces. 100%. Sorry, you were going to say something. Yeah, and you no, know, I was just going to say, you know, just like when I talked about back in the beginning with um, Battlefield 1942, watching that Jeep improvise and blow up that tank, when the chaos happens, that's when you really have to use your skills and, and adapt to the situation and find some unique solution. And I love those moments because you learn something that you can apply later on, you know. Uh, yeah, sorry if you're listening, we had some technical difficulties. Uh, with Zoom. Okay. So, uh, yeah, go for it. Yeah, we had some technical difficulties with Zoom. So now we're back. So Callie got interrupted there, but we were talking about tools that were missing for the game, tools that were missing for piloting. Uh, there's just a lot missing, but um, we are a little short on time. So I was thinking, Callie, you can tell me if you agree, maybe we just stop it now and give our audience some time to digest what we've talked about because we've hit a few things. And then um, we can have you back on maybe next week or another time. And then uh, we, my friend, we need to do some flying together and get some dropship techniques, build upon them and stuff like that. I think we're, I, I've been surprised that you're so much on the same page with Echo and I and our organization and everything like that. It's kind of refreshing. Yeah, no, I, I think that's good. Um, I, I think that comes though from being in a large org that, is really focused on breaking down and understanding the game so that we can be successful. And so I think it's just kind of that same mentality. We're just doing it at a bigger scale, which has rewards and challenges, right? But no, I, I think, you know, it'd be fun to fly with you guys, kind of see, you know, what you're doing and uh, see if, you know, like I said, the stuff I'm doing is kind of academic and it's kind of, um, you know, hey, this is what, I, what I've found we can do with the ship. This is some performance things. Um, I think it'll work in combat. I think there's some advantages to the straight in versus the flared, and there's some disadvantages to either one. And kind of trying to understand when to use them and how to use them is important. Mm. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges is the straight in landing takes a lot more estimation and distance, whereas the flared version, because you're coming closer, it's a little easier to estimate that, at least for me. So kind of testing those things in real time would be awesome. And yeah, certainly I'd happily come back. Yeah, that'd be awesome. And I have to agree with you with the flare. Like, I see the pros and cons of both, and I think the important part is is that you lay a foundation and you build those skills. So you have this tool belt full of skills that, you know, visibility is very important for a flare method. Sometimes Hurston and other microtech storms and stuff doesn't always do that. So you might be flying on instruments, so I can see a, a point where you might need to come in more you know, fundamentally with your traditional method of stopping. Um, there's a lot we could expound on, but yeah, um, there's a few, few things that like I need to polish up on. And like, I, like you were saying, like, I don't know everything. And that's why networking in this game is like the best way to do it. If you go, if you're going solo and we can kind of give this a shout out to anybody. If you're solo player right now, if you're looking for groups to play, look up the privateers, uh, look up Atlas, Find Callie Joshua. It's his name's right there on the screen. Get him. Find his YouTube. Hit him up. If you want to fly with him, go do it. You know, if you want a big group of people, they're out there. And this game rewards multiplayer stuff. It does reward that. And you will learn this game on an exponentially faster rate if you're with people that know what they're doing. It's really kind of cool to see. So, um. But yeah, that's uh, that's what I had today. Did you have anything else you wanted to talk about before we sign off for the end of this episode? 
uh, no, the only thing I'd, yeah, the only thing I'd say is, you know, if you're watching my videos and you've got questions, please leave comments. If you've liked something I do and it works, please let me know. Um, if it doesn't work, then, um, you know, let me know too. This is a learning process. Like I say in my videos, we're exploring what it means and I've got some ideas, but you know, we can find something different and they all go away. So I, I want that community interaction. I want people to uh, challenge themselves and see, you know, what works and what doesn't. And as we go through this, we'll develop more videos and more skills and learn together. Well said. Well, um, we'll cut it there, gentlemen. Uh, appreciate you tuning in. This has been another episode of Stuck in the Nail. In fact, this is episode 15. And uh, we miss Echo, but uh, he's having fun. Thank you for filling in today, Callie. It's been an interesting conversation, and we're going to continue this. So uh, I'm Daft Hobbit. With us is Callie Johnson. Uh, I almost said Johnson, sorry. <laughs> Callie Joshua. Um, and we'll, we'll catch you next time. We'll see you on the ground. <laughs>